you're listening to Death of the Reader. This is Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And Herds, we are returning this week to our brave world of literature. Returning from the Sherlock Holmes adaptation, Holy Trilogy, Holy Trinity, words. They're difficult herds, which is why we have to come back to books. It's okay. I know. That's why I'm here. That's why we've brought ourselves back, still in the modern day, mind you, still in roughly the same time period uh, in 2013. Uh, we've brought ourselves back to J.K. Rowling's own The Cuckoo's Calling. Uh, I'm excited to look at this one. There's a lot of great kind of poetic stuff going on. It's right up my alley, honestly. Uh, and we'll be tackling the detective Cormoran Strike in his unlucky endeavors. Yes, we are discussing the first two parts of the first book, The Cuckoo's Calling, today. Yes. And I did want to say, Herds, I, I thought, I, I, I'm i not sure if it was intentional, but I do love that we've gone from a book, The Sign of the Four, featuring a peg-legged man, to a book with a detective who is a peg-legged man. It's quite quite a neat crossover we've got there. You know, it, it wasn't, you know, my intention. It wasn't something I consciously thought about, but it was definitely part of my influence there, I have to say. So The Cuckoo's Calling is a murder mystery novel by J.K. Rowling, written under the pseudonym Robert Galbraith in an effort to try and let the book win uh, on its own merits, although the seeker is comfortably out by that, by this point, even though uh, Rowling is still writing the, the series using the pseudonym. Yeah, yeah. She's quoted as saying that she wanted to use this series, the Cormoran Strike series, as a new beginning for her writing after the Harry Potter books. So that's part of why she she adopted the pseudonym in the first place. She wanted to assume that anonymity, begin, and you know, without all of the, the pressure of trying to write the next Harry Potter, uh, she wanted to tackle something different, uh, but no less kind of uh, kind of important to her writing career. I will say out the gate here, Herds, I want to talk about Rowling and the pseudonym coming up on the third week of this book, because I think it will be difficult to get an accurate picture of it. I particularly found myself when I was reading through this first part, continuing to try and inject an opinion as to whether or not Rowling was portraying Robert Galbraith as an author or whether she was writing as herself and it was just a name and just all of these thoughts spinning through my head that I felt kept getting in the way. So I want to, I want to take that to later on in the show and we will be talking about that uh, in our final episode on this book. But I think ultimately the thing that stands out the most about this book is just the characters There are so many of them. There are so much going on. We have no closed circle. Everything is entirely open. It's kind of terrifying to keep track of everyone. I love that you're the one saying that because you're right. There are 37 characters uh, named in this book, most of which we meet. (laughs) Most? In more than one scene, mind you. I don't think my list is that long. So I've got a few people yet to meet, I think. Yet to meet or that have been named that we'll meet later, but- yeah, there, there's a ridiculous number of characters. And the fact that you're saying that when I'm the one who has trouble with names usually on this show, I'm I'm just as scared as you when I've read the book. No, so basically our crime is that model Lula Landry, uh, an adopted child and brother of uh, John Bristow, essentially falls to her death off her balcony. Her brother suspects foul play and comes to our detective Cormoran strike to try and investigate the case that the police have ruled as suicide. Yeah. The police have given up. There are so many excellent moments in the beginning of this book where we have very intense character moments that really just get the closest this book has so far to action right out the gate where we have characters, you know, yelling each other down and you kind of get the outside perspective of two characters hearing the conversation going on through the walls of the office. We have these incredibly tense moments as we start to explore the openings of the crime scenes and the characters' backstories it very much feels uh, removed from the classic golden age detective fiction stories where a lot of the characters are surface level to support the mystery, where instead here, the characterization is just absolutely thrust to the forefront. I mean, can we talk about the introduction of our detective? Because it is the most insane scene I have ever read, I think, in any murder mystery novel. I disagree but go on. <laughs> In terms of introducing our detective, it absolutely is. Normally when we get our detective, you know, they're smoking a cigarette, they're looking out the window, say, damn, another day in this damn city, you know, they're looking for the next. I don't think we've read a single book with that. <laughs> no, no, 
That's definitely what I know. Point is, uh, we're introduced to our Detective Corman strike through the eyes of our, our Watson, uh, Robin Ellicott, who has just been married and is uh, being assigned a, t- a temp job by an agency because she's just moved to London. It's this whole thing. But she goes to like walk in the front door of the detective agency um, and is firstly pushed aside by our Detective Corman Strike's ex on and off lover, Charlotte, who is an enigma in this story um, and is a constant source of, of strife, I would say, for Corman himself. And then, because she's about to, like, fall off a balcony and die, Corman lunges forward, grabs her by the breasts and pulls her back inside the office. Um, it is, like, the most insane amalgamation of kinetic energy and weird anime tropes I've ever seen in the introduction of a detective. Um, we know we know nothing about Corman at this stage, except that he is clearly insane. It is definitely a weird introduction, and I can't say I'm a huge fan of it. It felt very much like it was trying to be slapstick in a moment that didn't need it. And it also instilled in me a perpetual fear that the end result of this franchise is going to be the two of them getting together. <sighs> it has to be. It has to be. Obviously. Just, I, listen, I'm sure that by the time it happens, there'll be some plausible justification for it, but at the moment it feels just like, oh my goodness, Ooh. the attractive young person who's come to work for me, I will now, <laughs> I will now become her lover. It's like, mm, I'm a little, I'm a little off this train here. Well, we'll have to see how that, how that unfolds as the series, as the series goes on, but I mean, I feel like that's where J.K. Rowling is, is pointing us. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me. Because because yeah, like we're presented that uh, Robin is is in a marriage and she's very happy. Well, she's uh, she's just engaged, isn't she? Because the the opening is her being excited about pre- like preparing her wedding. She just got engaged like the literal day before this this all occurs. Um, but we can already see the cracks start to form in this book as as her uh, her fiance Matthew starts to like question Strike's methods and what he wants and all that sort of thing. Much in the same way that you're questioning him. So you know maybe there's some parallels there. Maybe you're the Matthew of this of this story. Maybe there is. And, and I mean, one of the things that this book does very very well is parallels. There are so many structural parallels that keep what otherwise seems to be an an, an absolute mess of a story kind of cohesive. You know, we have parallels between the crime and the introduction of our detective and Watson. We have parallels between the characters asking for help and the characters in, you know, uh, who are kind of off in the background that really help tie this together. The one that I'll talk about a bit later on this episode coming up when we're discussing the mystery is particularly the relationship between the detective and John Bristow, who asks him to investigate the case in the first place. I think that for all of the mess that this goes into about uh, Cormoran Strike's father, Johnny Rokeby, being like a rock star and his, you know, his family history compared to the adoptive family of John Bristow and Lula Landry, it is so confusing at first glance getting into this book and being like, where is this plot going? What's happening over here? What's happening over here? But as you start to line these parallels up, you can kind of see the themes start to creep out of the novel and- to some extent, I do think that the book still is a bit of a mess. It feels like we have so many plot points that I really have no idea how they're going to tie back around together at the end. You're completely right. It is absolutely a mess, but <laughs> it's a hot mess. It's the kind of mess I can get behind. But it's a hot mess that you can follow because the structure supports it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those like the the dot points of the story line up really well. Um, and something that I am looking forward to talking to, talking about, we'll, we'll mostly talk about this in, again in the third part when we finish the whole thing. But one of the really kind of clever things that I, I thought was kind of preposterous uh, at first, the uh, novel employs the use of some quotes at the beginning of its different parts from the Aeneid specifically, and also from Horace and Ovid, and it's it's insane. Uh, but uh, clearly J.K. Rowling is pulling um, in her inspiration, particularly for Cormoran Strike, from Greco-Roman heroes uh, and the struggles that they go through. Um, for the, for those uh, uneducated in, in in the Greco-Roman arts, the typical Greco-Roman hero is defined by the fact that they keep running up against the same problem over and over again and are asked to overcome it. Um, it's very different from the way that we typically think of of heroes as saying, well, well, in this chapter, the hero has this problem. In this chapter, the hero has that problem. Greco-Roman heroes, they have the same issue time and time again, and they have to keep proving that they're still 
courageous and valorous and they can still overcome it despite the like pain and the suffering they go through. And Cormoran Strike fits that archetype to a T. And I mean, particularly when you look at the, you know, ancient epic heroes, a lot of the story is about overcoming their hubris. And it seems that that is absolutely going to be the case in his story. I will say one thing that I did kind of chuckle at is how many of them are from the first book of the Aeneid. I'm like, hmm, maybe she hasn't read the whole way through. <laughs> but I, 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 she definitely has. Um, considering that her, because this is written after the Harry Potter books, and there is quite a bit of Endgame uh, Ulysses parallels in 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 Harry Potter books, like how he uh, how Harry Potter like disappears for ten years after getting his scar initially, and then comes back in the same manner that Ulysses does to like be the hero. I mean, as much as what we were talking with Simon Brett when we were speaking about a decent interval about the idea of superstructures and how they can really help define a story, with a story this messy, having the at least elements of a superstructure from classical mythology means that this mess of a story can kind of keep pace with itself. And kind of fittingly, if you look at a lot of ancient epic stories, they do have just enormous convoluted plots that go location, location, character, character, location, character. You know, it's not necessarily to quite the same scale in J.K. Rowling's writing, but you do kind of get that similar structural assistance at keeping everything together. Yeah, moving from location to location and typically never visiting the same location twice. Um, we kind of visit a character or location in this book, figure out what's going on there, say our piece, and then we move on. Um, the only constant, our, our ship in the in this long journey, you see what I'm doing there, mm-hmm. uh, is the, the office that Cormoran Strike not only works in, but also lives in, like he would, like he would a ship in the old stories. So I'm just saying... Jackie Rally knows what she's doing. Oh yeah, no, totally. Like as much of a, a mess as the book seems when when I got started, you can especially going through part one and two the second time, as I normally do before these shows, I was able to see the pieces falling into place a lot better. Um, particularly as you say, the the very locational structure of uh, of what is going on. I think the other thing that I found really interesting was Cormoran Strike and his investigative me- methods because there's so many moments where the incredible Robin Ellicott is called in and just handed a note and asked to go off and do something. And it feels like she achieves more than Cormoran sitting in the office than Cormoran does traveling around the entirety of London, which is kind of an excellent piece of subtext to the novel. But also because Cormoran, compared to some of the detectives that we've covered on the show, is so active about going out and finding the evidence and staking out places. And I particularly love um, the many times he arrives on a location looking for, for an individual and he's making comments about what he sees around the place, it feels like a much more human attempt to do the Sherlock Holmes-esque observing everything around him. We get a very in-depth kind of description of what of what Strike is seeing at any given moment, which I do appreciate, though I, I will admit in certain scenes, uh, I, I find that they drag quite a bit as Cormoran Strike, especially when he's interrogating a suspect, will go over every single question, even ones that we've already had answered before, um, which I find is actually, look, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to just criticize JK Rowling right here, but come on. That's what we're here to do. Some of these scenes are way too, some of these scenes are way too long. Is it, is it time to invoke the name of SS Van Dyne? <laughs> would you like to? I would love. Would you like to jump I in would love. and invoke SS Van Dyne? All right, go for it. Go for it. It, it, it would treat me n- no greater honor than to bring in the rule that a detective novel should contain no long descriptive passages, no literary dallying with side issues, no subtly worked out character analyses, no atmospheric preoccupations. Van Dyne's Rule 16 is the antithesis of how Cormoran Strike is written, and I think it makes an excellent case for why Rule 16 is one of the worst rules Van Dyne has on his list. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Because because like it, it is true that this novel drags in locations because it is trying to do all this carriage analysis and and all these you know all these little details that J.K. Rowling feels the need to throw in. But it is also the greatest strength of the novel, of the characters, and focusing on their struggles and the parallels and and the very poetic uh, rhythm that this novel has. Um, I, I did want to jump on something though before we before we wrap up. Um, uh, you mentioned that Robin seems to be getting a lot more done in this in this part of the story than the strike does. I one hundred percent agree. Um, but I love that this subtext is, of course, that Corman Strike hardly has any work except with crazy people, and it's really about Robin encouraging him to get back on his feet, which I love. It's not just you know Robin and 
and Strike have different skills and they complement each other, which they do. Um, but it's also showing the kind of journey of Robin coming in very excitable and enthusiastic and watching her kind of encourage strike as the story goes on. I mean, to some extent, that's part of why I'm afraid that the story will end up putting them together as a romantic couple, because I think that their relationship in that old fantasy Tolkien-esque just, you know, camaraderie is so strong that it'd be a shame to boil it down to just, you know, sexual tension. You know, sometimes that's just how it be. Sometimes you don't want to ruin a good thing you have, but you gotta take the plunge. Just how it be. I fundamentally disagree. (laughs) No. No, nope, totally agree. 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 All right. Romance. We need more of that in our murder mystery novels. Come on. I can back that, but not with this pairing, okay? Keep that away from me. That's all right. We'll see how the how the novel unfolds and we'll we'll go from there. You are listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds talking parts one and two of the first Cormoran Strike novel, A Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith. Herds, we will be back with more on this novel and me trying to get my first teeth into solving this damn thing in just a bit. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are here today discussing the first Cormoran Strike novel, A Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith, or J.K. Rowling, as you might know her. And Herds, it is time for me to come in and get my teeth into solving this novel, I am honestly a little terrified. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> Which of these 37 characters, well, I guess 36, will you accuse uh, of the, the killing of Lula Landry, if it even is a killing? Now, let's let's just open this by saying, Herds, that my initial impressions going through this novel was that there were so many things going on that even trying to figure out which characters were relevant to the mystery as opposed to who were relevant to Cormoran Strike's private life was a challenge. But then one scene happened. They went with Robin and Cormoran and were hanging outside the crime scene. And Cormoran says, being pushed over a balcony, it's a sign of hot blood. And I thought to myself, it's over. I've won the game. This mystery is done for because it's one of those lines, Herds. It's one of those lines where you can can just smell it. You can just smell the mystery oozing off it. And I thought to myself, there's only one character so far in the novel who's been angry, aside from Cormoran himself, and it's John Bristow. Oh, interesting. And if we look at John Bristow, there are two characters in his private life that have mysteriously ended falling from high places both of whom were his adoptive siblings, he stands to gain an enormous inheritance, clearly is a man who cannot keep his anger in check, and two matching crimes, a thematic that the detective has caught onto, it's just, it's so neat. It fits together so tidily. And I had to ask myself at this point, Herds, was this enough? Was this enough to pin the crime? And... I wasn't, I wasn't incredibly sure about it. And this was when I did something that I've never done before, Herds. And this was before, before thinking about the how, before thinking about the who. I mean, a little bit after thinking about the who, but... <laughs> that already occurred to you. Doesn't count. I looked at the motive. <gasps> and I thought to myself, what? why would the culprit of this crime approach Cormoran Strike detective to solve a crime that the police have already ruled off as suicide. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. I was about to throw that at you. Why, why, when he has already allegedly gotten away with it, come to someone to try and solve it again? There's no reasoning that you could possibly make there. And I thought to myself, Herds, why of all people would he then come to Cormoran Strike? And the answer that I have for this question was, Cormoran was there when Charlie died as well. And Cormoran was close to Charlie. That's why uh, they know each other. That's why John Bristow knows Cormoran. If he failed to notice a very obvious connection back then, surely he would fail to notice an obvious connection now. And he knows that Cormoran has connections with the police, as he mentions in their opening discussion together. And he also knows that his mother is currently, you know, ill of health and he stands to gain an enormous inheritance from his adoptive parents. 
So surely, if he has an incompetent detective who the police trust, an inheritance to gain, which will probably be investigated as a matter of course, and plenty of money to throw around to actually hire this trusted man to solve- to incorrectly solve the case, it- it just- it fits together just as neatly as I thought the initial- the initial solution did. And... I don't know, Herds. I, I'm, at a, I'm at a bit of a crossroads because I feel like part one and two alone don't quite give me enough to work with. You know, obviously, John Bristow was keeping his fingers on the case and is trying to kind of push things in certain directions. And, you know, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised to see more of him coming up with other uh, with other characters of his own accord to provide evidence. So I'll be very interested to see how he develops as we go on. But I think more or less I have that man dead to rights. Considering how much of the story is showing that Evan Duffield, Lula Landry's on-off boyfriend, is just completely innocent and has this, you know, iron-wrought alibi, and how many of these other characters just seem to have not been in the right place at the right time, I, I don't know who else I can suspect. Obviously, we don't have the how for John Bristow, because supposedly, you know, people saw what was going on. There was Wilson, the security guard, who was there at the time. You know, there's there's a couple of contradictory details that don't really make sense. But given that the thematic of the story is that John Bristow is paying off Cormoran to investigate a crime incorrectly, more or less, it would not surprise me if he has done the same to these other characters. Well, that's that's kind of the funny thing, is that if you accuse everyone of being paid off, then like, shh, that's that seems like a very convenient kind of explanation. You know, every, everybody was in on it. That's something that can only work once in a blue moon. Um, but but that is, that is kind of the tricky thing, isn't it? That John Bristow was not seen anywhere, you know, uh, near the uh, the apartment of Lula Landry um, on the on the day of her death. Um, and we have some kind of, some kind of periphery clues, uh, we'll see particularly talking about, you know, the alarm pad, um, and the driver talking about how, you know, nobody else would be trusted to take Lula anywhere except for me. Like, it seems like Lula has a pretty tight security team. Um, I mean, she, she moved to this, to this, the building, you know, for the security, it seems they've got this new security team and all these high walls and things as well. I, I don't actually think, I don't actually think, uh, that there are that many people that need to be paid off. You said there were 37, some characters in the novel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm thinking that at most, including Cormoran, we'd have to pay off three to make this work. Sure. Who do, who do you think has been paid off then? Uh, I think at, at least one of the neighbors. Okay. Uh, potentially Wilson, though I feel like he is implied to be, uh, implied to be innocent and Cormoran. That would be the only three because I think, uh, <laughs> particularly the fact that supposedly the security guard, you know, ran outside to check on the body when I believe we're told that he was told that there was someone else in the building. Um, you know, that's suspicious to me. That seems a little strange, but you know, morbid curiosity, it's not that far fetched. So he's a maybe. Uh, but I think I think at least uh, is it uh, Bestigui was the name of the neighbor. Oh, uh, that would be I believe it's T- Tansy. I believe it's her name, Tansy Bestigui. Yeah, she's she's the one that we kind of end the second part on saying, "Oh yes, I heard a man shouting upstairs" and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and and of course that scene being with John Bristow is immediately suspicious, and Cormoran already notes that there are contradictions in her uh, in her description of events. So it's you know. I, I think at least she is uh, probably on a payroll of some sort. I was going to say, I, I will I will say, because we are given a series of contradictions around her testimony. Like she says, you know, I heard a man shouting and my husband was with me in th- the entire time. These are the only two points she seems to be able to be uh, completely adamant about. But we are, we are told time and time again that she couldn't have heard anything from the room above her. Uh, because the the walls and the and the windows are are effectively soundproofed. Um, also, why would why would she need like why would she need the money? I guess is the, the question. Like I know we haven't gotten that far in the novel yet, but like yeah, she's doing lines of coke in the bathroom. She seems well enough off. Um. <laughs> I'm I'm definitely a little suspicious of it. I feel like there might be some relationship trouble going on there, or you know. Uh, particularly because of the way that she seems just forgetful of her partner. 
Um, it like her alibi almost makes it seem like he wasn't there, and the only reason we know he was is because it was mentioned in the police report. Okay, it's it's a little strange. I feel like she may have been doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A- apparently, apparently, what happened is that her husband was like trying to keep the police away from her because she was hysterical. Uh. Um, and the and the explanation the police give is that it's because uh she was like trying to clean up the coke, but the coke is also like in the bathroom, so it's like a bit of a weird situation there. Um, yeah, I almost feel I almost feel like uh, the part of the payoff was like maybe John Bristow provided her with the coke because you know he knew that her husband wasn't a fan of it or something. I will say if you can if you can figure out exactly what's going on with Tansy Pasigui and her husband, I exactly how how define exactly here, Herds. F- f- the why, the who, and the how. I want I want a similar method to solving the murder case, but for Tansy and her lies. Like why, what is going on there? If you can figure that out, mm-hmm. um, I I think you have the the clues to do it. Uh I will give you your second point for this episode, uh, is where I'm gonna seek that. Oh, for this episode, I gotta do it now. No, well, you know, this week or next week. You you have a bit of time to do it. But I'm just letting you know. Okay, all right. Well, I'll I'll hold off until next week. I'll say my initial thoughts are that her husband isn't a fan. Bristow probably provided the coke as a payoff, and the, uh, her husband realized that she was doing coke, and that's why he tried to escort her away from the police. That's my initial guess. Interesting, interesting. Uh, but I, I don't have a lot to back that up with other than circumstantial evidence. Sure, sure. I will say, why on earth would uh, John, if he is our killer- uh, despite the parallels that may make him seem like a killer, if he is our killer, why would he go to the trouble of paying off all these characters uh, and then do the murder? I've I've said I've said two characters. All these characters is a lot. I know multiple characters who, uh, two of which live in the same building, live and work in the same building uh, as Little Landry. Why would he not hire them to do the the deed for him? I guess is the question. Uh, because Herds, as evidenced by, uh, Cormoran's comment about hot blood, I don't even necessarily think he planned to kill her. Interesting. I think he may have planned to confront her and ask her to, say, withdraw from the inheritance. Uh, but, you know, we will have to see about that. Um, you know, obviously having two people in on a crime when they have just been paid is always a little bit flimsy as a method. Because, you know, they could always just ask protection from the police or something along those lines. So it'll be interesting to figure that one out. But I don't think it will quite impede my investigation. Sure. Alrighty, fair enough. I will say, though, Herds, before we wrap this episode up, Mm. I was really hoping that the wolf mask thing would come into it more. You know, it it probably will end up being something like the culprit was wearing a wolf mask so they couldn't be identified because that's something that uh, Lula Landry's boyfriend, Evan Duffield, did to get around the paparazzi. I was really hoping that we'd just go full BBC Sherlock and have a cult of wolf mask people secretly stalking the models of the city of London. I... <laughs> I don't think that we'll quite get that crazy. Although you, you do bring up an, an excellent point that this story is about uh, class difference, though through the frame through the frame of uh, of, of fame itself, of, of popularity versus uh, you know not not being noticed. Uh, much of the same way that uh, Cormoran Strike is the son of a of a famous rock star and yet has no fame and nothing to show for it himself. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely an element of the story to keep your eye on. I think, um, that idea of obscurity versus popularity, uh, definitely important. Alrighty. Well, Herds, I think that's all the time we have for this week on the show. I would love to get into more talk about the class distinction in this novel coming up next week on the show. Definitely tackle that. Yeah. What are we covering next week? We'll just be looking at part three next week. It's, it's long enough on its own. Um, there are only five parts to this novel, and f- part five is incredibly short. It's only two chapters. So we'll be tackling part three next week, uh, and then we'll wrap up the show the time after that, as usual. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Herds, thank you very much for guiding me through the mess of an opening to this novel. It's beautiful. I'm looking forward to covering more of this next week. This is Death of the Reader. We are talking The Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith, a.k.a. J.K. Rowling, and we will be back with more of that next week. You're listening to 2SER.